Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's Daily Devo. It is April 2nd, and we are in Psalm 75 and Hebrews 4, and today I'm doing it with my kids down here, so we'll see how this goes. Uh, but pardon, pardon any interruptions that, that might happen. This is just how devotion life looks sometimes, so that's totally fine. You can read the Bible anytime, no matter what the distractions are. You can read the Bible. So I'm going to prove it here right now with Topher being behind me. What's up, buddy? You want to say hi? Um, wait. He doesn't want to say hi. All right. Let's kick it off. Psalm 75. <clears throat> we skipped Psalm 73 yesterday uh, because of the, the Instagram mishap a couple days ago. So we'll come back to Psalm 73 on one of the weekends. But for now, let's keep moving on to Psalm 75. We are now well past the Psalms of David. <clears throat> and this psalm is actually prophetic uh, in, in, in a way. It actually, it actually has a, a time of the Lord speaking from his point of view. And here's how it starts in Psalm 75, 1. <clears throat> we praise you, God. We praise you, for your name is near. People tell of your wonderful deeds. You say, I choose the appointed time. It is I who judge with equity. When the church and all its people quake, Sorry, when the earth and all its people quake, it is I who hold its pillars firm. To the arrogant I say, boast no more. And to the wicked I say, do not lift up your horns. Do not lift up your horns against heaven. Do not speak so defiantly. No one from the east or the west or from the desert can exalt themselves. It is God who judges. He brings one down. He exalts another. And we'll stop there for, for right now. It keeps going a little bit. Uh, but the point of this psalm is just that the Lord is completely in control. It's him who appoints the time for certain rulers to be over other rulers. Any any earthly power or kingdom uh, that rises to power is only doing so by the hand of the Lord. He's the one who exalts some and he lays others low. Everything is in his control. And this is a powerful thing for us to see that, that no matter what's happening in the world around us, that God is in control. The beginning of it is, is a beautiful, the, the very first verse in the psalm is a beautiful prayer. It's that, Lord, your name is near. There's power in the name of Yahweh, in the name of the great I am, and his name is near us as his people. Let's draw near to him. All right, so that's, that's our psalm for the day. <clears throat> now we are into Hebrews and we're going to keep going. We, we read Hebrews 2 and 3 yesterday. Now we're going to read Hebrews 4 which is talking about the Sabbath rest for the people of God. And in Hebrews 3, remember, the, the author of Hebrews gave us this picture of salvation being like a great journey through the wilderness where at the end is the promised land. Um, and he compares it to the wilderness generation who had been brought out of slavery, out of Egypt, and then led through the desert by Moses and a pillar of fire over to the literal promised land of Canaan. He compares it to that, but what we know from that story is that that generation did not actually enter the promised land. It came to the promised land and then they became too afraid and they backed off. And then God punished that, that entire generation uh, by mandating that they wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that whole generation passes, which is crazy. And then this author of, of Hebrews is, is comparing us the church, Christians, God's people, to that generation and saying, what are you going to do? Because the same situation now exists. Just like before, where Moses led his people through the wilderness to the promised land, Jesus is now leading us through the wilderness of sin and death in this world that is ruled by, by the prince of, of evil, Satan. Jesus is, is, is leading us through so that at the end we have the promised land, which is the kingdom of God which is the Lord and his dwelling. And he's saying the exact same thing is happening. It's today. He compared, He says, Psalm 95, today, if you hear his voice, well, that's now. We're being led by Jesus. So what are you going to do? Are you going to follow Christ? Are you going to follow him into the promised land? Or are you going to be like the faithless wilderness generation that we're too afraid to enter? And this is why in the beginning of chapter 4, he says, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us, just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them, because they did not share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have, who have believed enter that rest. So he's saying, 
Just like them, we have the word of the Lord, except this time we have Jesus, who is better than Moses, who is greater than Moses, and we have the power of Christ to lead us through. He's saying that means that means we need to be we need to be walking. We need to be journeying. We can't be sitting on our butts. We can't be like lazing around in sin. We need to be following Christ. And this is this is when he he talks about Joshua, how Joshua actually did lead his people into the promised land. But he's saying, guess what? J Joshua didn't really fulfill that. Joshua didn't lead his people into the rest of God that Psalm 95 is talking about when God says, you will not enter my rest, you wilderness generation. You're going to be you're going to be walking around and scavenging for 40 years. And he's saying, did, J did Joshua lead his people to enter into the rest of God? And in, in Hebrews 4, he says, no, Joshua didn't. Joshua was just setting the stage for someone greater than him to lead his people into the true rest of God. And that is Jesus. And the cool little thing that, that the author Peepers is doing here is he's, he's actually using Joshua's name to point to Jesus because Joshua and Jesus in Hebrew are actually the same name. In Hebrew, Jesus and Joshua are literally the exact same name. They, they've just been, um, over, over time, the, the name Jesus in English has, has kind of morphed into something sounding different than Joshua. Um, and so he's saying, guess what? We have a new Joshua. We have Joshua the Christ, the one who is leading us into the promised land. And here's what he says in, in, in verse 12. In that note, he says, so don't, don't, sit, on your, don't sit on your butts. Go, move, and follow Christ. And here's what he says in verse 12. For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to, sympath uh, unable to feel sympathy for our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So this verse, for the word of God is alive and active, is often said in, in, in a way of talking about the Bible, right? Like people say, look, the Bible's alive and active. It says right here in Hebrews 4.12. That's not what Hebrews 4.12 is saying. He's saying, for the word of God is alive and active. The word in Greek is logos, the same word used in John 1 when it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. The word, the logos of God, is the actions, the speech, the very being of God is the logos. And he's saying God's word, his, his word to us, his actions, his, his very being, his leading us, his guiding us, all of that is alive and active. And he can see every part of you. He knows if you're disobeying the same way the world in this generation was. So don't even try hiding. You can't hide from the Lord. So that's, that's really what Hebrews 4.12 is saying. He's saying that, that, that God's word sees you. Now, does that include the Bible? Yes, it does. It, it includes the Bible, but it's not just the Bible. It's all of the Lord's seeing and speaking into our lives. He is active in our lives. And he asked for us to be active in, in this journey of salvation, in this journey of life that Christ is leading us to. And he says at the very end that Jesus has ascended into heaven as the great high priest and given us access to God the Father so that we can find grace and mercy in our time of need. Guys, yes, he's, we're required to, to stay strong in the faith we profess, but we only do that by the strength that Christ gives. And then he offers us the chance to go into the throne room, throne room of God as, as his children and ask for help. And we have that ability through Christ. So we have the greatest help ever. We have, we have a, a help and a power that the wilderness generation never had. And therefore, we have the power to stay, to stay strong and stay true in the way that the wilderness generation didn't. And the author is going to continue that, that theme in chapter 5, which we're going to talk about tomorrow. That's my encouragement to you guys. Uh, same, as, same as the end of chapter 4, hold true to the faith we profess. 
for Jesus is our great high priest. He's our Joshua leading us to the promised land. And uh, let's end with the benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thanks for joining me today. Have a great day.